And now, by redesigning it around Apple Silicon, we've done something huge. Actually, we've done something mini. This is the new Mac Mini. The chances are that the M2 MacBook Air will be just fine for what you need. If you're pushing the M1 or M2 machines to its limits, then it is worth upgrading. Like the MacBook Pro is a stunning example of what a great laptop should look like. It's light, it's thin, it's portable, fast, powerful, efficient. And I, for one, can't see me needing to upgrade or replace this machine for a very, very long time. Is in bloom the peer a transmissions will resume I try to push try to keep us all down down and hope that we will never see the truth around figuring out the best computer setup for me over the past few years has been a long and pretty expensive process but I think I think this is going to be the best setup for me balancing both price and performance. And I was so impressed with the new M4 Mac Mini that, yeah, I actually bought three of them. One base spec, one base spec pro, and then one higher spec uh, pro model. And all these machines are incredible, but these are also incredibly frustrating. Now, firstly, just a reminder, if you enjoy these videos, please do consider subscribing. It makes a pretty big difference, actually, like 90 5% of you watching these videos aren't subscribed. So if you are in that like tiny 5% that do, a uh, huge thank you. And I hope you enjoy this video. Okay, so like everyone else on the internet, I'm gonna run a few tests on these Macs to see what they're capable of doing. Now, personally, I was really interested in seeing how well each one of these Macs worked with my studio setup with that 57 inch, 240 hertz ultra wide monitor, because that has actually been quite challenging to get working with Macs from time to time. And also how well it works when running the Mac mini via a dock because since the Mac mini doesn't have regular USB-A ports anymore, you might wanna hook that up to a dock like I have here. So let's get the obvious out of the way. Now the new Mac mini is tiny. It's literally the same size as my CalDigit dock, uh, nearly as small as my Focusrite audio interface, uh, even the anchor charging station I have on my desk. It is insanely small, but the size does come with its frustrations. Now there is no SD card slot on the front like the Mac Studio, but Kind of then again, for like 99% of people, they won't need this. So I can kind of forgive them for that. And that's why I then have the Cow Digit dock next to my Mac Mini. And the second, of course, everyone said this before, is the placement of the power button on the bottom and at the back, which the internet either thinks is a total non-issue or a big, big problem. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm used to the power button being in what I think most people would agree is stupid places at times. <laughs> um, and even on the previous generation Mac Mini, I think they were in a pretty sensible place for a machine that you rarely power on using the button. Like mostly it just gets left in sleep mode since, you know, it consumes barely any power when it's in sleep mode. But come on, like so many people I know, like myself included, end up putting their Mac Minis because, you know, they are more mini, tucked away into a location where you don't need to get to them that often. And even the Mac Studio that I had before fitted perfectly under one of the desk shelves I, I had used to have before this. And so for the Mac Mini, I tuck mine under the shelf here on my desk. At home, I have it tucked under an anchor shelf dock thing that I've got. So I get that it's fine because you rarely need to switch it on. But God damn, is it annoying to pull like everything out of its place just to reach that button at the back underneath. But it is what it is, I guess. So in terms of the specs, I bought three of them. So let me just explain why. Now, firstly, I have an M1 Mac Mini at home, which I bought back, you know, when that launched. And it has been crazy good to me over the years. Like currently, it just sits in the corner of a room. It has two SSDs attached to it with loads of my family's videos and photos. And that is all then backed up online to Backblaze I'm using for that. And that's, that's like my life. Like all of my memories, all my photos, all my videos, everything is stored on there and taken care of in uh, this, you know, the Mac Mini tiny box. So I decided to upgrade that to the base spec M4 Mac Mini for another reason, which I'll explain in just a minute. Now, the second Mac Mini is for my studio. That's the base spec M4 Pro Mac Mini, although I did bump up the storage to one terabyte, even though in hindsight, I really shouldn't have. And I also upgraded the Ethernet port on this one to a 10 gig connection as well. So we have a Synology NAS in our studio, which also has a 10 gig connection, which is where then we store all of our footage for, you know, every video we've ever shot. 
Now, sometimes I do go through and clear old stuff out. And again, all of that stuff is backed up, again, through Backblaze, just in case something goes wrong. And I bought that Mac Mini, this, that Mac Mini, just so I have a machine at the studio so that, you know, whenever I'm at the studio, I can use it, but also one that Hudson, my videographer, can use to edit videos if he needs to. So I needed the M4 Pro chip in for that one. So that's the second machine I bought. Now the third machine is another M4 Pro Mac Mini, again with the one terabyte upgrade, uh, again with 10 gig ethernet, but also with the higher spec CPU and the bumped up memory to 48 gigabytes. And this is like Hudson's workhorse when he's editing videos. But something we've also been struggling with here at the moment is giving the editor who edits these long form videos uh, access to like all of our footage. So far we've been throwing it into uh, Google Drive, then he downloads it at his end. We've got like four external SSDs for him now so that he can download and like store everything there. So now something we're working on still to this day is giving him remote access to this higher spec Mac mini that we've got, which has a 10 gig connection again, directly to the NAS, which holds everything on it. And there's no like, no waiting for footage to sync or download. As soon as we dump the footage onto the NAS, he can then edit. And because our editor is in New Zealand, generally speaking, when we leave the studio for the day, he's then waking up and starting his day. And then when he goes to bed, we're waking up. So that kind of means that we can share that one Mac Mini. And so again, if for any reason Hudson comes in and it's still in use, well, he can just use the one at my desk instead because, you know, that's all set up. Now I have an M3 Max MacBook Pro. It's an absolute, absolute beast. But most of the time, all I really do is like email, scripting, web browsing. I don't need anything like an M3 Max MacBook Pro. And I actually really, really miss having a, a much lighter MacBook Air. So my plan eventually is that when the M4 MacBook Airs come out, I'm going to swap my MacBook Pro for a MacBook Air. And that will be my setup for the foreseeable future. Because these M4 chips are so capable, even the non-Pro chips, genuinely, they are really impressive. Like you cannot buy a Windows PC that is this powerful for the same price as a base spec Mac mini. And that's like completely forgetting the size. You'd have to build one with like used parts, with a big case to even try and beat the price for performance that one of these things gets. So the M4 MacBook Air, even again, the base spec, again, is probably gonna be way overkill for what I need. But what are the differences? Because, you know, that's what everyone wants to know, right? Now, since we have all three models here, I thought I'd run through uh, not the many, but a few benchmarks just so you can see the differences and then make your own mind up as it's whether, you know, whether it's worth going for the extra for the M4 or the M4 Pro or the, the more memory or the faster M4 Pro chip that we all have here. We've got three different versions, thought we'd do a few tests. Now I'm actually going to post a buyer's guide for the M4 Mac Mini next. So again, subscribe if you want to see that video go into more depth on each of those upgrades and whether they're worth it and the alternative options. Now the first test we did is for the video editors out there. Now with the new Final Cut 11, there is a feature that uses AI, AI features, uh, to remove a subject from the background in video footage. So we added a one minute clip and tested how long it took to do that across all three machines side by side. It's actually really, really impressive with how easy it does this. You literally like click once, click go, and it just does it really accurately. Now for the M4 Mac Mini, the base spec M4 Mac Mini, it took one minute and 39 seconds. For the M4 Pro, it took one minute and 33-ish and a half seconds. And for the M4 Pro with the upgraded CPU, upgraded memory, it took one minute 34, so like a fraction of a second faster. So all in all, the M4 Pro Mini was around 6% faster than the base spec M4 Mac Mini. But again, like that will like extrapolate out the longer the edits you do, the bigger the difference. And then the top spec M4 Pro Mac Mini with the extra memory and the upgraded uh, CPU in it was literally like splitting hairs, like pretty much bang on what it was doing. Now, what I will say here is that we had to run these tests multiple times because a lot of the time my lower spec M4 Pro Mac Mini actually finished first by like five seconds. Uh, like we, we double checked everything. We closed all the background apps, same resolution, refresh rates, check the Final Cut render settings to make sure nothing's, you know, going on in the backgrounds. But it still sometimes would finish before the higher spec machine. So just worth noting that. Now, next up, we loaded a test project from Bruce X, uh, which uh, I've kind of found online before. Now, this is a test project. Again, I've used before on previous videos, and it's just a short but very good project full of like various clips and layers and graphics and all sorts of things going in there. So I can share the results that we saw, but then you can also go and download the same test and run it on your own machine to see how fast your current machine is and then determine if the M4s, you know, are that much better than what you've already got. So we ended up exporting this project in ProRes 
422LT. And for the base spec M4 Mac Mini, it took 12 seconds, very fast. The M4 Pro and the upgraded M4 Pro was like nine seconds. And again, the upgraded M4 Pro was maybe a fraction of a second faster um, than the slightly lower spec M4 Pro. It's not a huge difference. But in this case, the M4 Pro was around 25% faster than the base spec M4. Now again, feel free to run that Bruce X test on your own machines to see what it does for you. I do really think that we need a, a new benchmark test though. Like these M4 chips are legitimately really fast that you, you know, 12 seconds or, or nine seconds isn't really fast enough to do much to the system to, you know, tax it, put any real stress on it, which don't get me wrong. It is incredible. They are such capable machines. Even the low entry uh, like M4 is insanely fast. So that was the kind of end of the video kind of benchmark test. Then I know we don't do very like mathematical data driven tests here. It's just a case of, you know, run through a few basic tests. There are people on YouTube that do all those tests. We're not those people. We just want to kind of show you, you know, what it's like to own these devices. Now, next, again, something I know that most people, you know, won't really care about because the Mac is pretty useless when it comes to gaming. Now, yes, I've seen them. There are plenty of things you can do to make you know, non-Mac games work on the Mac, emulate Windows, run it in a VM, like do all sorts of things. But for most people who don't want to jump through all these hoops just to be able to, you know, play some games on your Mac, we ran a couple of tests. So two games here, we ran Resident Evil, which runs natively on the Macs. And it's one of the games that Apple keeps using as an example for, you know, how powerful Macs can be when games are designed to run on a Mac. Now, this was hooked up to a 32-inch 4K 120 gaming monitor, and that monitor kept reporting a fixed 120 FPS, which I don't think was working properly because it always reported 120, even on some other tests we ran. So just, I think just ignore the whole 120 thing. This isn't like an FPS test. It was just, again, general gaming performance. But even at max settings in Resident Evil, full resolution, 4K 120 on the base spec Mac Mini, it absolutely flew through this game. But I will say that from the games I've played, Resident Evil isn't exactly something that looks like it needs much processing power nowadays. Like, honestly, it kind of looks like a game that you could probably just play on your phone nowadays. Maybe I'm being a bit harsh to the game, but yeah, there's real, like, high graphically intensive games. I struggle to find any with, you know, without purposely going out and finding, like, the one. I went through my Steam library, nothing really on there. Um, and then since Macs don't run pretty much any, again, AAA title, I thought I'd just fire up Fortnite on Xbox Cloud Gaming just to give that a try, see how well it worked. Just as like a, you know, if you've got this Mac as your like one main machine at home that everyone shares, what's it like? Because you can, you know, fire up some Xbox games and maybe try using your Mac for those. And I will say here that the gaming experience, specifically on Xbox Cloud Gaming, was horrendous. <laughs> like I tried through the Brave browser, tried it through Safari, Wired, Wi-Fi. The whole thing was just jerky, janky, stuttery. Uh, for some reason, in one game, my controller decided to just flip the X and Y axis on both sticks. So that was just horrendous and not fun. Now, I also tried loading up my Steam library again to see what games I could install. Basically, there's nothing that would really do that much to stress test the Mac apart from like, what, Counter-Strike 2? That's literally 20 years old. That's, you know, that's not going to stress test anything. So yeah, hopefully there are some proper like AAA titles that come to the Mac, maybe in the future. But equally, when everyone seems to be avoiding Apple because they're just like you know, sucking up money from developers via the App Store, I'm really not sure that they will. Now, next, I want to check about how well the M4s coped with multiple monitors because that's always been a touchy subject over the years with, you know, Macs only working with one monitor and not able to drive bigger high resolution screens. And Apple does state that even the base spec M4 Mac Mini should work with three displays. Uh, displays sold separately? obviously. So starting with the Behemoth, that is the 240Hz 57-inch G9 from Samsung. Now this is when hooked up directly via HDMI. And the good news is that even the base spec M4 machine can run this screen at full 7680 by 2160 resolution at 120Hz on this screen, but which is as good as you're going to get. Like I've never gotten the full full resolution 240 hertz from anything other than a Windows PC and uh, a Radeon like a 6700 XTX card, I think it was. So then I wanted to see what else we could do. So I pulled out the new CalDigit TS4 dock and hooked that up to a second monitor via DisplayPort. And that worked mostly fine. We got 4K resolution, but I think only at 95 hertz refresh rate, something like that. And basically this is kind of where we got stuck. Like I tried so many combinations here with the 57-inch G9, HDMI, DisplayPort, 
Thunderbolt to Displayport, Thunderbolt to HDMI, more Cal Digit Docks, some Anchor Dongles. Like, I couldn't get anything more than two screens working, which to be fair, the 57 inch screen on its own is basically two 4K screens like side by side already. Now with two 32 inch monitors, we have one via HDMI, one via display ports. I was able to get full 4K 120, 4K 240, which is what those screens were rated for. So again, that worked great. And then finally, because we have a few different screens here, we hooked up two of the 32 inch screens. So one via display port, one via HDMI, and then the Dell 40 inch Thunderbolt display, which we reviewed a few months back on this channel. And because that connects directly via Thunderbolt, kind of thought it would have worked, but we still had those same issues. Like only two screens would work, which isn't three screens as kind of advertised. However, what I will say there is that the main screen we had in both of these kind of situations, the Samsung, the Dell, were higher resolution screens and higher refresh rates. And unfortunately, we just don't have enough like plain 32 inch 4K monitors here to test with. But I would assume, I would assume that the three 32 inch displays, 4K displays, should be fine like maybe even at 120 hertz maybe even higher than that uh let me know in the comments down below if you have this kind of setup and you've been able to test this uh, maybe let me know down in the comments below and i'll update the video description if someone can help me you know help answer that one for me so whilst the m4 mac mini is without a doubt my personal favorite apple product launch of this entire year pretty much it is also one of the most frustrating because Apple are still absolutely unashamedly and disgustingly ripping people off to upgrade anything beyond the base spec model. Like as soon as you touch the memory or the storage upgrades, these machines go from a bargain to just an outright scam. Like Quinn from Snazzy Labs quite rightly pointed out that Apple's upgrade pricing is beyond broken with prices that haven't actually changed in literal decades. Well, what about the SSD? Because SSDs have gotten really cheap over the years. Oh yeah, no, no, those upgrade prices are identical too. This was six years ago, but you think that's bad? <laughs> oh buddy, buckle up. And all of this is stupid because now I have to tell you that instead of keeping this, you know, beautifully designed micro portable machine standing proudly alone on your desk to go and buy a separate M2 SSD buy a Thunderbolt enclosure, and you can now upgrade your storage for literally half the price. And in many cases, storage which is actually faster than the built-in storage. Uh, the memory, I guess, is really the only thing that there is some argument that, you know, well, because it's soldered on and integrated with the M4 chip that is unified memory, it's faster and better, but it's then impossible for Apple to separate them and therefore it's worth the value. I'm not sure I agree. Like considering Apple, proudly tout you know how environmentally friendly their products are once again apparently doesn't include having user replaceable or upgradable parts but again it's kind of apple they've always been doing that now i'm actually going to do a deeper dive on this on which mac and which upgrades matter and which ones make more sense to you know buy separately with different third-party parts in my next video so again subscribe if you want to see that video but it doesn't fix the problem that you know as incredible as these new gen m4 mac minis are the uh, the Apple tax, that a phrase that is very, very well known, very well understood what it is, is still very much here. And honestly, it's only really getting worse as the years roll by. To a point where I potentially even say, out of principle, do not give these people a dime of your money. They are like ripping you off. Except the Mac Mini is stunningly good with practically zero competition at this point of time. I don't know, perhaps the next generation Snapdragon Elite or Intel or AMD chips will rival this. But right now, at least for the base spec Mac Mini, is actually one of the safest and best value for money computers, given what I've just said, that you can get if that computer has to be a Mac.